the X webinar. Uh, topic is how to retain more customers beyond Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, really excited to be chatting on this topic today. I know it's a pretty hot topic of discussion in the space. I uh, want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Lauren Lovato. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. No worries either way, but uh, I'm a partner manager here at Gorgeous, um, and I'm joined by one of my partners, actually, Luigi from Kalashot Commerce. Um, Luigi, you want to take it away and introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. My, my name is Luigi. I'm the founder of Kalashot Commerce. We're a specialist big commerce uh, systems integrator with offices in Europe and North America. Uh, we're one of the first big commerce partners. We started working with them in 2009. And I think we've been partners for a few years now. Um, Laura, obviously, we used to work together, and Lauren, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and hopefully help a couple of merchants retain more customers. Definitely excited to have you on today, Luigi. Thank you. And um, no headshot on here for Miss Laura, but Laura will be um, moderating our conversation today. So, Laura, want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Laura Kerber. I am manager of the commercial partnerships team here at Gorgeous. Our team works with a lot of really amazing agencies, including Luigi. I've had the pleasure of uh, working with Kalashak for, I want to say, definitely like nearly two years now. I think I actually reached out to Luigi on LinkedIn one time because I noticed Kalashak was killing it in the big commerce space. And I was like, man, like would really love to work with them. And yeah, I think he was kind enough to respond and we've been partners ever since. And Lauren joined our team back in, in June and she took over the partnership with Kalashak and has been doing a really great job and all leading up to this webinar that we've done for the first time with Kalashak. So really excited to, to be on here with you guys and talk to everyone about uh, how to retain all your customers that you just got during the busy Black Friday, Cyber Monday season. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Laura. Um, so just want to point out a couple of things, like really encourage everybody to, again, be present, ask questions, give feedback, really engage in the chat. Um, again, we want this to be a very, very open discussion. Um, you know, participation is key for that. And um, because of that, we want to entice everybody with a couple of giveaways. So at the end of the webinar, we're going to be choosing two lucky people at random, those who are most active um, in the chat. Again, asking questions, interjecting thoughts, ideas, um, really anything, feedback um, to win some of these awesome prizes. So um, Kalashok is going to be giving a 30 minute free consultation. And then uh, we're going to give away some, some AirPods. So you can listen into maybe that consultation on, right? So um, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started, shall we? Let's do it. All right. All right. So thank you again, Lauren and Luigi for joining. I'm super excited to get both of your insights on this topic. Retention is something I'm super excited about for 2023. I feel like the past few years, it's all been about, you know, acquiring new customers, you know, running ads, getting as many people in the door as possible. We've seen a little bit of slowdown on that. You know, ads are becoming more expensive, not necessarily as effective as they were a few years ago. And so now there's been this shift in focus into, okay, we've got all these great customers into our door. How can we keep them coming back? How can we retain them? It's relevant this time of year because, you know, we just got off the busy holiday season. I'm sure many of you in the audience have brought in, you know, a ton of new customers you've never spoken to before. And this is actually a really key pivotal opportunity for you to turn those first time customers into lifetime customers and keep them coming back all year round. So with that, we're going to be talking all about retention today. And I guess, you know, before we get into the specifics, why don't we just start off with, you know, what retention is and, and more importantly, how do you measure retention? Luigi, do you want to kick that off for us? Sure. So I think kind of it all boils down to, it's quite simple in some respects. It's just about doing the homework. So the way that we 
um, kind of recommend or we instill that our merchants measure the retention is looking at the lifetime value of the customer. And any business should be doing this, whether you are a B2C, a B2B, whether you are a, a web development agency or whether you are an e-commerce um, company selling online. You need to understand what is the typical lifetime value of that customer. Because if you know that that customer over the course of its lifetime with you, which might be three years, um, will give you, I don't know, let's say £3,000 or $3,000 or €3,000, whatever, of, um, of sales, you can then start working backwards from that and saying, right, what's going to be my profit margin on, on this customer? And therefore, what can I afford to spend to acquire that customer? Because if you've spent some money to acquire that customer in the first instance, and they're in, you know, they're, they're kind of become a loyal customer to you, whether it was $10 it cost you or $15 or $25 to acquire that customer, that investment is done. And as long as you've got enough margin now to kind of maintain that throughout the lifetime value, then really it's kind of quits in. And I think a lot of time people either don't look at the bigger picture, they look kind of, in, they're quite insular and in saying on this order, it's too small or this order, if I refund them or if, I, if they ask and send them back, I'm not making enough money. You need to look at the bigger picture. And yes, you know, there are always edge cases and it's not, there are some nuances between B2B and B2C, but it's everyone knows that it is cheaper and far better to get an existing customer to buy from you than it is to acquire a new one. And I think we've all been guilty of kind of just glossing over that and trying to look for the next customer, assuming that the customers that we do have are just going to stay with us. So I think from it's, you know, I'm not going to kind of use a cliche and say, you know, we've lived in unprecedented times during COVID, but it was, a lot of people were just kind of, you know, thrown for six because they got, we got so many customers that just got so, so busy over, over COVID by doing nothing. They just like our turnover, you know, went up 400% overnight. So how do you prepare for that? How do you, you know, you, you become a bit complacent. You say, well, I'm getting all these customers every week. And that's when now we're getting the phone call saying, you know, we were crushing it during COVID. Now, not so much. <laughs> we need some help. And it just, you know, it, I think it's the simplicity. But you have to take a step back and say, right, you know, that customer, how much are you going to earn from them over the course of whatever lifetime it is? Can you extend that lifetime? Um, and, you know, if it's not enough, how can you get them to buy more? If it's satisfactory, fantastic, but always be pushing mm -hmm. them. But I think if you ask a lot of merchants, they won't know what typical lifetime value for a customer is. Yeah, I definitely echo that. I think looking at customer lifetime value is super, super essential. Um, but even even looking further into that, like measuring net promoter score or as other people distinguish it as NPS um, really is beneficial as well. Right. Um, this really just measures the customer loyalty and can be used to help predict a customer's likelihood of making that repeat person purchase. And um, high NPS score can really encourage customer advocacy, shows that customers are extremely satisfied with the product and are willing to actively promote it. So I think also looking into, into that is, is super beneficial when, when looking at retention as well. I mean, what do you uh, think, Luigi? Are we, uh, are we assuming everyone knows what NPS is? Because I still come across people that don't, they've done it. They, they, Net they, MPS is kind of when you get the email saying from zero to 10, how likely I yeah. to return. And I, I've done research kind of over the years about NPS and the jury's still out as to whether it's a good gauge, but I'm a big fan of NPS because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you might get that person that has bought from you once and why haven't they bought again? Now I can go on a slight tangent here, but just to keep it back to it and that promoter score, I've seen the responses for that some merchants get, which is your shipping's too expensive at like four dollars or four pounds. And it's kind of like, well, it costs seven to ship it, but fair enough. You know, four is fairly expensive. Um, you were too slow, you didn't communicate with me. Um, and so MPS is, is I think is a really good gauge. The problem is, you know, you're only going to get probably a 10, 15 percent response rate. Mm -hmm. So and again, you're going to get the ones that are on either side, the ones that are real detractors that are saying, I really don't like you and I'm it's the same with reviews you know reviews you don't get from average Joe that's content you get them from the ones that love the product or the brand you know what you know the, the what it stands for or the ones that hate it you and you're going to get the same uh -huh. with MPS which isn't you know too bad because again like I said you don't know what you don't know and 
I think it's, you know, you can address it and say, well, I'm sorry, $4 is actually quite a competitive shipping price to send something from the West Coast to the East. Um, or, you know, people saying it took too long. It's like, well, you selected, you know, we ship it by ground because we have to, and it takes three days or whatever it does. Um, so I 100% agree that MPS should be on everyone's kind of marketing mm-hmm. plan, um, you know, and do them every three months to different kind of cohorts, different groups of customers to just try and get that average feedback. Luigi, you brought up reviews, and we actually have a question in the chat about reviews. How can businesses use customer reviews and ratings to build trust and credibility with potential customers? You've just got to be genuine, I think. Like, nobody is perfect. Everyone's dropped the ball some, whether it's it's the, in the warehouse, it's the manufacturer or it's the delivery company, there's been orders, it's a numbers game. There's been orders that just haven't arrived in time, have arrived damaged, whatever the reason. And so unfortunately you, you can't shy away from reviews because now they are a, a, a staple of, of commerce in general, not necessarily even e-commerce. So you have to kind of be where your customers' eyeballs are. If, if you, if you have, whether it's Trustpilot or whether it's FIFO or whether it's, you know, Trustpilot, whichever kind of review systems they are that you use, you have to engage with them, just like with social media. And I think leverage them as well. So if, I mean, just again, taking it slightly away, one of the ways that, find a lot of customers our customers our clients retain their customers is they offer a good service and we kind of know this because we all tend to buy from hypocrites from sorry from amazon that's because i know he's that line where i say i'm a hypocrite we'll buy from amazon and we're all kind of semi and anti-amazon but the reason why we buy on amazon is we know it'll arrive when they say it'll arrive we know that they'll only send the stuff that's in stock we don't most of us don't look at the price most are just saying, I know that it's going to arrive whenever. If I've got a problem, they're very good at sorting it out. Where, you know. So we know that there's an element of support we're going to get from, from Amazon. And so really merchants need to look at that as well and say, right, if we got a review that was bad because you know the parcel arrived damaged, let's address that. So let's address the review and say we're really sorry, you know, uh, didn't you know whatever the the response needs to be but we'll you know we'll, we'll get in contact and i think it's important you don't just say please dm us you have to explain because people will read that and say right, how did they react to a parcel arrival right damage so we're really sorry you know we'll get in touch and um, we'll send out replacement you know whatever it is without kind of over committing because i think people will see through any reviews that are just five stars across the board you can't get away with that nowadays you have to have the odd one that isn't happy because you'll always get that one that you can never no matter what you do whether you deliver the order on a silver platter with white gloves and the the time that they ask for they're still not going to be happy so you're always going to get that and you need to kind of so and once you kind of get those and you know for sure promote them you know whether it's on social media channels whether it's on on um, on your website because customers will want social proof You know, they're going to want to see how somebody else that bought that product, you know, either used it or what they thought of it or whatever. And especially depending what industry you're in, if you're coming to something like fashion where size and fit comes into play, you want to get that feedback mm-hmm. that, you know, it's a bit tighter than unexpected it or it was perfect or it was light or it was heavy, whatever. Because that's feedback that A, the merchant can take back and say, right, how can we improve either the product or service or whatever. But actually, your customers are going to say, right, this is the product for me or this isn't the product for me. And it's OK for a sale to, to, to not go through because chances are if they weren't happy or 100 percent convinced when they were buying it, you're probably going to get that as a return, depending on what industry you're in. So I think it's really important that if, if you can kind of demonstrate to your to your customers what they expect to get from you as, as a merchant in terms of service, what kind of the majority of your customers think of again they're going to be edge cases you're going to get it's sometimes difficult to incentivize customers that are kind of on the fence to leave reviews but you're always going to get the ones that either hate it or the ones that love it and i think you just need to promote the ones that love it um as much as you can you know in emails in in social media in, in advertising if you you know if you, if you do any um, you know, any kind of offline advertising just you've got to tell everyone because that's how you're going to differentiate yourself because then that's not content or it shouldn't be content that the marketing team have written that's like a genuine customer that said it was great it arrived on time it arrived early you know solved my problem whatever it is that that they're raving about 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think one thing too, to keep in mind is like, I love that you said, you know, respond to every review and leave an explanation because I can't tell you as, you know, being a consumer myself, um, buying from brands on Instagram and all these social media sites, like how many times I say an, oh, DM me when it's somebody comments and says, oh, like my product derived damage. Like I want to know how they handle that. Mm -hmm. But moreover, I think one thing to keep in mind too, as a brand, as a merchant is your response time to actually responding to those reviews. Because if you have, you know, whether it be a great review, stellar review or a negative review, if you wait, you know, a day, two days, a week to respond to that, that's a telltale sign too of what kind of overall customer service you're going to be giving to to consumers. So, I mean, all in all, just like definitely respond to reviews, but also figure out a process to do it in a timely fashion, in a timely manner to where you're able to access those, those responses, um, those reviews and respond in a in a you know timely fashion. It, it has to be systemized. There has to be a process yeah. in there. So right every day, you know, before like, you know, we all try to achieve inbox zero and it doesn't always happen. But it's kind of, you know, we, we should at the end of the day or at lunchtime just say, right, I'm gonna dedicate, you know, 15 minutes to just checking reviews and responding and liking yeah. or acknowledging and thanking. Because also there's so many different platforms now, you know, whether it's Google review, whether it's Trustpilot, whether it's FIFA. So it's really important that, you know, Unlike social media websites where maybe you just focus on one particular profile, with reviews, you've got to be omnipresent. Like You have to be as much as possible mm -hmm. um, uh, on there. And, and, and again, on, on social media where people, if they're talking about you on Twitter, that you get straight. And I'm, you know, obviously, you, you've got to kind of take things offline because you don't want to get into like a muscling and match if the customer is just not reasonable. But you, like you say, you need to demonstrate that you are on it, that you are responsive, that you are acknowledging. Um, so that, you know, like you say, it, it is a reflection on how you're going to you know, deal with the customer if there is a query. Exactly. I added my thoughts there in the chat too, but when you guys brought up the example of someone, a, a brand just responding, hey, like send us a DM. Like the first thing I think is, did they respond to their DM? Like we don't know how, if this was ever resolved. Um, and then Luigi, you also mentioned, you know, seeing five-star reviews across the board. Um, I always, I always think of that as a, a red flag too. Even like if I'm looking at recipes, I'm like, there's no way every single person yeah. thought this was five stars. Tastes very so different. So um, yeah, like if, if someone, you know, didn't have the best experience or didn't enjoy your, your product as much as, as you wanted them to, very important to address that and, you know, address the reviews that come in and show your other potential customers that um, you are responsive. And if they do run into an issue, you are there for them. Um, and that's how you, that's one of the ways that you can really build a lot of loyalty. Now we have a question in here from Zach. He was asking about Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, basically like when to stop the purchase incentives. And I think this leads really well into our next question. Um, we want to retain customers year round, but do we see any differences between the customers that come in during the holiday season um, you know, versus the spring or summer. So my question for you, Lauren, is do customers acquired during Black Friday, Cyber Monday show different retention rates than clients acquired outside of the holiday season? I mean, I think it's it's dependent on a variety of factors, right? One, the biggest thing, of course, I'm going to say is customer service, um, but also product quality and overall overall experience that that the consumer has had. Like, was it easy to to get my questions that are, you know, pretty simple questions like where do you ship? What sizes do you carry? Were those questions easy to be answered directly on the website without me having to reach out to somebody? Um was was the website easy to to maneuver around? How long did I wait for my for my order to arrive? So there's there's a number of different things um, in terms of rates. Like I don't have any said statistics, but um, I know I was reading an reading an article um, just a few weeks ago. I think it was from Clavio, and um, something like it was like six percent 
there was a 6% increase in sales during the Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend compared to last year. So although like, you know, people are saying the economy is changing, things like that, that didn't, that didn't really slow down, slow down this, this, you know, holiday shopping season. Um, So, I mean, going back to the questions, you know, do customers acquire during this the specific time of the year, um, do those show different retention rates? Um, my guess would be, would be, yeah, there might be a higher, a bigger opportunity to, to retain those new customers that you're attracting with, with the holidays. But, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to think what you think, Luigi, on that. Well, just quickly on that 6%, um, I think big commerce came up that their merchants received 14% more. Okay. And kind of we're all tiptoeing around it, but everyone's trying to save money. Yeah. And when's the best time to go and save money on the, you know, it's going to be Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So that's why I think you potentially had people that either were spending more because they're saying, right, I'm going to stock up. Or people saying, yeah, I mean, I'm not massive Cyber Five. I'm normally too busy to even remember that it's Cyber Five because obviously that's our busiest period. But it, I don't normally kind of, you know, bother but this year is kind of like you know let's see what what were well, more for also um interest but see what's going on around merch instead of big discounting going on with some brands so i think from that perspective yes people spending more but i they wanted to save money i think mm-hmm. fundamentally um going back to the um kind of a, a customer's different one thing that we need to be aware of is that there's different types of customers that shop with your brand during cyber five so one that we so when we run workshops with merchants whether it's a replatform or or just a kind of a strategy session is to really understand the customer so and primarily it's who you're marketing to but who what kind of customer do you have navigating on your website and we normally have about one or two depending on on the type of business but really you can go up to about five because if you're looking at something like a cyber five weekend you're going to have somebody like me going onto a jewelry website to buy a necklace for my wife. I will never visit that jewelry website during the year. And so you need to, you need to be aware that there are going to be gifters that are going on at black Friday, cyber Monday sales that are not going to buy during the year. But that's the opportunity for you then to say, right, if you are buying a gift for somebody, why not try and capture some additional details post sale you know kind of who you're buying for you know do they have a birthday what was the reason to have a birthday and with our partner clavio you can run all these different kind of um capture this different uh, dates in the profile but to understand saying well if you know if i want to say well i'm buying something for my wife and her birthday is in april they may ping me an email a month before three weeks before her birthday and say you bought this product for christmas why not buy this product for her birthday? Now, it, you can go really deep. It's not it's an easy exercise to do. But I think a lot of people forget about those gifters that they think, well, it's a one-off. They're never going to buy again. That's not true. Because if you, if I got an email saying, hey, it's your wife's birthday in, in four weeks' time, not only did I just remind you so you don't forget because we've all done that once, but also here are two or three products that might complement what you bought her. Mm-hmm. You've just solved the problem for me because I'm like, do you know what? Add to cart, check out, off we go personalization is key you know there that's nail nail on the head especially when building that loyalty and retention with brand or not with brands but with consumers so exactly yeah no that's that's an awesome thought so you need you need to again it's kind of it's the simplicity of saying right who are we targeting okay. you know i mean we're talking primarily b2c here but it doesn't mean we can't do b2b either um obviously the, the buying trends and behaviors are different but on a b2c perspective you know, you're going to have the ones that are just, you know, they are bought into your brand. They are the raving fans. And we've got some customers like that, that, you know, as soon as a product is dropped, bang, is sold out because they're raving fans have bought. It's incredible. And how, how the brands often achieve that is by being kind of putting a face to the brand, by being present, by being able to, to engage with, the, with, their, with their customers. So they're not really technically buying from the brand anymore. They're buying from the person. Um, and, but on, you know, on, on the B2B side, again, you're going to get people that maybe, especially nowadays when, you know, they're looking at cutting costs, if they, if you did run a Cyber 5 um, 
uh, campaign and they are new customers and you can identify that in your CRM or your you know, CDP or whatever it is, then you need to start marketing, like you say, from a personalized point of view. So somebody that's maybe bought um, computer monitors isn't getting um, an email about TV stands. You know, they have to, you kind of have to start to understand who your customer is and the type of products they're going to be interested. And all this data is out there. It's data can sometimes be like a minefield. Um, but if you get the right systems in place, then you can really start to not necessarily understand your customer. The systems will understand the customers, but you can understand what triggers you need to uh, implement for your customers to to, to become repeat, repeat buyers. So I hope that kind of answers the question in some respects. Um, I kind of yeah. I think you I think you guys nailed it. Um, we talked about some differences between the customers that are acquired during uh, Black Friday Cyber Monday um, versus you know, customers that acquire out that we acquire outside of that time. Um, I think the gifters is a, a really great example. And you gave some really amazing tips how to how to get those gifters purchasing, you know, in April and in, in the summer and in the fall as well. Um, any before we move on to the question, we talked about the differences. Any similarities do you see between these customers um, that purchase during this time versus throughout the rest of the year? Not to me. Um, I think like one thing is definitely purchase behavior, right? Because both groups of, of customers, they may engage in similar purchase behavior, such as researching products before making that purchase and considering multiple different options before making that final decision. So all in all, like really setting setting your brand apart like are you going to be providing post care instructions if you are selling jewelry or maybe bedding you know are you going to continue to educate that customer on on um things related to the industry you're you're selling in such as like skincare or beauty products things like that so um i would say yeah purchase behavior is definitely a, a big similarity even post purchase behavior, I would I would right. suppose as well. They're like, all they're all gonna need customer support. They're all gonna want yeah. really timely responses from your brands. They're all gonna want to see the reviews. Um, I totally agree with that. Yeah. What are some processes that you have seen that either of you have seen to be successful when working to get first time customers to purchase again and again? Um you certainly have to create loyalty. So you need to kind of find some of those hooks that your customers are going to grab hold of to keep coming back. And one of the best ways to do that is to, is to leverage your unfair advantage, something that your competitors can't easily replicate. So from an agency perspective, one of our unfair advantages, we've been doing big commerce since 2009. Now, most like 95% of agencies we come up with cannot kind of compete with that. So we've got such a breadth of expertise in, in our sector and you can't buy that. I can say, you know, we've got 10 developers that specialized in BigCommerce. Somebody can hire 10 developers that do BigCommerce. You know, we've done 15 websites this year. Somebody else can do 15, but what they can't do is keep up with that unfair advantage. And that's something that brands also need to do is kind of what are you really good at? that your competitors can't necessarily lay claim to. Um, and try stay away from that price discussion because the only people that benefit on the price war is the customer. It's just, it's a one way street. Um, and what you need to focus more on is the value buyers. The one that's saying, look, you know, I mean, again, going back to Amazon, I don't buy much from Amazon if I can avoid it, but I buy without necessarily looking at the price. Yes, I'm not gonna pay 45 pounds for a you know a, a bag of coffee because i know i can get coffee that costs a quarter of that but i know that if about if i'm buying coffee and it's 12 pounds instead of 10 or 15 instead of 14 i'll buy because i know that it'll arrive tomorrow and maybe i need it tomorrow so i'm a value buyer I'm, I'm buying into that service rather than the product rather than the price one of the reasons why we and i'm a, a massive fan of gorgeous is it centralizes the kind of customer service aspect. And I think that's really, really important because your customers are everywhere. Your customers are on email, your customers are on um, well, on phone. WhatsApp now is making a massive resurgence. Um, SMS as if we're like in 2003 is making another resurgence. Social media platforms, just everywhere. Live chat, 
So take something like Gorgeous out of the equation and say, right, off you go. You've got five social media platforms. You've got WhatsApp. You've got an SMS. You've got emails and you've got contact forms. How many systems are you using to manage that? And so one of the things that we say to our merchants is by leveraging something like Gorgeous, what you're able to do is centralize it. Now, I'm not here to kind of necessarily sell Gorgeous. What I'm trying to say is that if you become more efficient in that, in that process, your service becomes more efficient because you're not having to switch between 16 different platforms in order to achieve the same objective. And again, going back to the reviews where we can demonstrate how we dealt with something, if I know that I'm buying something from your store, Lauren, and I've got a problem, but you're responsive in replying to me, um, you know, I, I get to understand you a bit more, then I've got confidence in buying with you. And I'll come continue buying. No, I want to buy from Lauren's store because, you know, they ship two days and it's all pretty much always two days. Or if I order by four o'clock, it's, you know, it, it ships the same day, whatever it is that, you know, I, I, I attracts me to your, to your business. And it's really important that those are the, you know, we don't just kind of look at what cheapest, we offer the biggest discounts because that's just a customer you don't really want. It is saying, I'll, part, I'll, buy, I'll, you know, I'll buy a product and I'll pay for it. And that's what everyone does. But like you say, it's how do people deal with, you know, the returns with the mm. loss, you know, the, the tracking that maybe they send me an email because with Amazon, again, if whether you buy a $12 book or a $3,000 TV, the process is the same. You're going to get an email that says, thanks for your order. Your order shipped. Your order's out for delivery. Your order's been delivered. Again, it doesn't matter what value the product is. You're going to have that information. Yeah. It's, it's um, all about experience and consistency. It seems like communication is the number one thing. It's yeah. just not really, you know, it, mm -hmm. it might be that you know, if I place an order now, that TV might be might be delivered tomorrow morning by ten o'clock. But if no one's telling me, I don't know. And so I'm gonna say, well, the same as everyone else. Amazon will deliver it by Saturday. Well, actually, the company I, I could be buying from might deliver it through tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And so it's communicating all those elements that kind of say that we're different, and this is why. And I think if you try to be everyone, you know, everything for everyone, you just you're gonna please no one. You just you know you're going to be um you're just going to fall by the way so what you need to do is really work on on that competitive advantage and that unfair advantage mm -hmm. and say this is why people buy from us and and that will then reflect in your mps scores going back to the beginning and your reviews because it's like they were super responsive uh you know omnipresent i they whatsapp me the status of my order and all these different things that i think really do stand out and it's so important at the moment to work as much as possible to retain customers Mm -hmm. all industries yeah and i i really like what you said um it was just a while back when you know being present in all your channels there's so many channels out there that you know it's necessary for brands to be on like mm -hmm. you said luigi there's you know social media there's email phone sms chat like it's insane to be mm -hmm. able to like have all these different tabs open, respond to all these different messages. So definitely consolidation is key. And that's also going to allow to be more responsive and present, right? Because think about it. I mean, you brought up Amazon and that's a perfect exa example for wanting this instant gratification, right? And people want that with response times as well. Um, like I know for a fact, you know, I, we have we have data that shows that 90% of US customers, they do rate an immediate customer service response as either being important or very important, where 60% of those people who needed support defined immediate as 10 minutes or less. Yeah. And um, I mean, so that's speaking volumes. And then on top of that, we know that about 31% of customers, they want a response to their email in one hour or less if they are emailing. So if you don't have some kind of process in place that that allows that kind of consolidation, that kind of, you know, linear view to look at all of your different channels, it may be a big headache. Um, but all in all, like it's going to be beneficial in in that that timely fashion that people are expecting, expecting these responses to their questions. But, you know, on top of that, even having um, some level of personalization uh, to to those responses, like like you already mentioned, um, you know, asking for the birthday when you're purchasing jewelry during the holidays, because then I can or as a brand, I can give you personalized recommendations for when that said birthday comes. Um, 
that really makes makes a huge difference too and can be accomplished through uh through consolidating channels as well i think going back just quickly on the sms side yeah. um most of us don't receive SMS from brands that we interact with. So if SMS becomes part of your marketing strategy, you'll be certainly in the minority. But I read a, a statistic that most messages, most SMS uh, messages are open within three minutes of receiving them. Show me an email campaign that can achieve that because that's nigh and impossible. And so, it, again, it's kind of finding all these edge cases and saying, right, where can I just be different for my my customers um, yeah that's so true i mean we gotta you gotta be where the people are right i always yeah. i say that all the time when talking to talking to some of my partners and it reminds me of the little mermaid just i don't know little side note but like be where the people are um yeah. and that is that is on their phones right on our phones we are we are texting all the time we have social media we have whatsapp um, so being present in those channels is going to make a huge difference and give brands that competitive advantage. Okay. Can I just interject one more time around kind of the, the SMS? I've got no, well, not, I've got no problem. I'm a lot more relaxed giving people my email address than I am giving them my mobile phone number. And so for, if, if you do find that people do give you their mobile phone number, they're actually letting you into quite an intimate part of their I guess ecosystem because it's their mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So what that demonstrates to you is that they're buying into your brand. They're trusting your brand with their data. So as I said, emails, I can give yes, the, the mobile number. I'm a lot more cautious um, about also leveraging mobile. So apart from kind of having a website that's really easy to navigate with and, uh, you know, use whatever, there are review platforms that allow customers to create UGC. And that's something else that brands should be leveraging is kind of saying, right, how can we make mm -hmm. our customers sell on our behalf? Mm -hmm. um, and so take away, you know, the kind of the influences, the micro influences. It is saying, you know, Luigi that bought the watch or the phone or the wine or whatever it is that bought, let's try and get him to, you know, not just leave a, a review, but show the picture, you know, of that product. Because that is also, again, more genuine. If you've got, and that's why you see on like hotel websites and on Amazon as well, that they're trying to push the UGC where customers have taken photos of. Now it can go either way, obviously, um, but at the same time, it just enforces that credibility and integrity by saying, "Look, here are some real, you know, some real people using our product." That's so true. And guys, we have uh, Danielle here in the chat asking about the latest trends in e-commerce and tools as well. I think you guys did a really great job covering some of them. Um, would love to hear, and I also appreciate the the shout out of Gorgeous too. Would love to hear though, if you guys have any other specific tools that you think can improve engagement, both pre-sale and post-sale over time. It can really mm -hmm. depend on the industry, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and it depends on the type of customer as well. So we work we're very lucky to work with some brands around the world that have built a following kind of a cult of raving fans around the brand um we've got two in um in, in the states one in in scandinavia and they've managed to build this community so those customers are now promoters for that company you know they they will tell other people they're the ones that put a nine and a ten on kind of an nps on an nps score so if you can find a way to build the, that community, that relationship, leverage social media, and just try to cut through the noise and the fakeness that social, you know, sometimes can consume social media um, and just, you know, have, just stand for your values and, and make sure that people can see them. I think that's one of the best ways. It's just going back to the basics and saying, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is how we operate. Um, we're seeing a lot, if we want to talk necessarily about not, products but more around kind of sentiment sustainability is a massive thing at the moment there was a report um in the uk that people would be happy to pay for shipping if they knew it was and wait longer if it was going by a sustainable method than get like a free next day delivery and i think we've become very aware around the fact that we all have a small part to pay, play mm -hmm. in um in you know kind of trying to help sustain the um the uh, and so it, it just goes down to you know being genuine, and that's how you can start to differentiate yourself. 
um, packaging is one thing you know about recyclable packaging make making packaging suitable for what you're shipping we've, we've all seen parcels arrive that are just stuffed full of void filler and not only is that a waste of money for the, for the, the merchant but also if you think that you know maybe a van can only take x amount of boxes on each day and the boxes are getting bigger the number of box the number of orders that person can deliver goes down which means more vans on the road and you know it spirals out to kind of say more pollution and whatever so i think we you know we need to just take a step back be aware of how we're shipping things if there's anything that we can do to kind of make that can that product can the packaging be recycled by the customer you know pushing those values there in terms of kind of technology um i think personalization is key and that's everywhere that's on site so if I go into my Amazon page, it's going to be far different than yours, Lauren, and, and yours, Lauren, and, and you know the many other people that we've got that joined us on the webinar. Um, you know, when we're searching on websites, if I'm searching for a particular product, there's systems out there that can use you know um, AI and, and, and so on to understand the type of products that I'm looking for, and the recommendations will change depending on that. Um, so you know, if I go into a website and type red shirt, I could get a red shirt and for men and i could get a red shirt or red blouse for women or, or kids or wherever the system then gets to understand that you know i'm looking for men's products i'm looking for formal products and, and start to um show me different results um on, on, on my visit so the personalization is key because we're making it really simple for people to buy and like mm -hmm. you said we're spending most of our time on mobile so we need to make sure that that experience loads as fast as possible so we're not you know just waiting getting frustrated that it's taken like two seconds to load or three seconds to load or open a second um, and then make it really easy for people to buy just try to remove as much of that friction as possible um because i think that's another way you can retain customers is like it's just so easy to buy like they accepted apple pay they accepted paypal they accepted you know debit cards credit cards whatever we want to to throw at it yeah no i totally agree and i mean to just add on to that you know making it easy to buy easy to function is one thing but like also allowing for giving self-service options to your customers like whether that be a chat bot or an faq or help center page because there's people who have you know commonly asked questions they want answers quick they don't care how they get them so by putting the power back into the hands of your customers it leaves more time for you as a brand your cx team to handle matters that actually require more of a personalized, um, customized approach, right? So, um, you know, think questions like, where do you ship? What sizes do you carry? Um, you know, the most commonly asked things, people don't really want to wait around 10 minutes for somebody to respond on live chat or for an email to be responded to in a couple of days. Just have it somewhere on your website that's easily accessible. And it's going to make, it makes a world of difference overall in the overall experience. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. Personalization is key. And I imagine it differs across industries. It might be different from CPG to, to beauty mm. brands to clothing. I've thrown a question I've, in the chat, guys. I would love to hear from you what industries you're in. And while you're throwing that in the chat, I have a question for Luigi and Lauren. How do retention strategies differ across the different merchant verticals? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start here, like thinking about like fashion and apparel, right? Um, that those particular verticals, they may focus on providing personalized styling advice, um, offering exclusive promotions and discounts to repeat customers and or creating a sense of exclusivity among among those who are most loyal. And then like thinking about subscription-based services, um, you know, whether that be like meal delivery services or like skincare delivery services, those kinds of brands, they may focus on creating a sense of, you know, exclusivity and community among their subscribers. Um, creating a community is one of the best ways to build loyalty because when you have when you have this community where people feel like they are a part of a bigger purpose, a bigger, a bigger motive, that creates a very high value experience and keeps those subscribers engaged too. I think I agree with you about kind of the um, exclusivity element. 
And one of the ways that you can maintain, obviously increase loyalty, but try and maintain some some retention there is to make the customer feel like they're getting something that others aren't. So rewarding their loyalty. Now, one of the, the most obvious ways is kind of with loyalty programs. So, you know, for every dollar, pound, euro you spend, you get a point and, you know, 100 points is X amount of, of money off. Um, what what we've done with some merchants is private sales. So you need to log in to get those, you know, discounted prices. But not everyone is part of the customer group that gets access to those prices. You need to have placed X amount of orders or you need to have signed up to, you know, whatever um, um, those kind of criteria are. So making those customers feel special, like, you know, I'm getting something that others aren't is is a really simple way like it's depending on your econ platform um but most platforms will have some form of customer segmentation you okay. could turn that on tomorrow say you're right you know going to take off the uh you know the, the top 10 percent of customers and put them in a vip or a vvip group then you know the next 10 percent they're going to vip group and these ones get you know percentage discount um, and then you can run private sales for you know for the next week you get an extra 10 percent off with this coupon code or with promotion and start to interact um, with that around kind of the different industries and, and so on. Yes. So fashion apparel, we, we know has a very high return rate, um, but we're seeing a lot of merchants now push back with paid for returns. And I think it's only fair. I mean, I was with a merchant in the North of England last week. They, um, they uh, sell kind of uh, retro clothing and, and they blacklist customers and they showed me why. So it's like, we, you know, this one customer placed 13 orders had returned 12 and not like one item, but like return the order. Um, so whether, you know, whatever reason they were doing it for, whether they were kind of, you know, using it for photo shoots or whatever, but they're saying, we're just sending out orders, paying for it and then paying to return it. And so restock and whatever. So um, I think that's obviously one thing. Now, the difference between B2B customers and B2C customers is often B2B customers are based on needs. I need a computer i need some shelving i need some you know monitors a b2c customers will want something i want a blue jumper i want a macbook i want a 40 inch tv and so the way to market to those and, and merchandise to those customers is different the b2b is very difficult to you know throw a promotion at them and kind of say that you know stock up or whatever again it can value it can change by the different um types of customer industries that you've got um but that's you know you can't sell somebody six shells when really they only wanted two but you could sell six bottles of shampoo to somebody that only came in and bought three because it's some you know it'll just sit there and they'll use it eventually so it's it's so different it's that you know it, it's vast i think that the misconception is kind of e-commerce is the same and it's not you really need to start you know kind of approaching all the different markets and sectors differently um, and person you know there's so many systems out there that make it easier but you really need to kind of put your thinking cap on and say right how can i you know incentivize my customers how can i make my customers feel special how can i make sure that you know we're making the, the journey as simple as possible so that kind of wants and needs but you know ask yourself um you know does my customer have wants or do they have needs because if it's needs it's, it's somewhat easier to sell because you can address those direct needs. So I need a, again, let's use shelving, uh, this much weight it has to take, this is the size it has to be, the height and whatever. Um, you'd be very hard pressed to kind of say to someone, hey, you know, we've got a shelf, buy two, get on free, and they say, well, I don't really need this particular size, but I'll buy it anyway. On the B2C side, it's different. You know, they're a lot more open to kind of being influenced because that is a want. I want a computer, and I, you know, I want a MacBook. Maybe I don't need a MacBook. Maybe you could do fine with a, you know, MacBook Air or something. But with with B two C, we're a lot more kind of you know, airy with that approach. So that's kind of how it's. Um, but it all goes back down to, again to what I said: just knowing your customer, understanding your customers, undertaking market research, you know, sending out emails to try and get some some feedback on them, um, and those NPS scores. I can't kind of you know push those enough. That, that you know that there's such valuable feedback that you get from those i love that simple distinction between i want versus i need when talking about b2c versus b2b customers um guys we're down to our last five minutes i can't believe it um it's flown by 
let's start uh, to the audience. Let's start getting those questions in the chat. We're going to we're going to answer all of them. Um, in the meantime, while you're getting those questions in there, I've got a quick question, lightning fire question for Lauren. How does customer support affect retention and what are the benefits to merchants for offering good customer support? This is something she is an expert in having worked at, <laughs> at Gorgeous here for the, the past eight months. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in short, if you don't provide a great customer experience, great customer service from the get go, I mean, that customer can that customer can just drop off. Right. And so by being personable, by ensuring that your customers are getting the answers they need quickly, whether that is, you know, personally by a human or in automation via AI or a bot or or an FAQ page, like it doesn't matter. Like you need to do what you can to ensure that you're responding quickly um, in a timely fashion. Customers are getting what they need when they need it. Um, moreover, like customer service, just having that having that valuable feedback going back to like the reviews as Luigi was talking towards the beginning, um, that those reviews, that feedback, it provides valuable insights to how, you know, you can identify certain issues or pain points that a customer may, may have with your brand or product and to better that for, for the long run to continue to grow the brand. So there are, there's many other factors, but like, those are the two that really come to top of mind at this moment. Very true. And we're still waiting on some questions. So Luigi, I have a question for you as well while we're waiting. <laughs> How does offering a great customer experience through custom built e-commerce stores affect retention for your clients? And in addition to that, what are the benefits of having a custom built e-commerce store? We get this question quite often because some of our websites can look like templates. One of the fundamental um, laws of usability is that most people spend most of their time on other websites. It's called Jacob's Law. Jacob Nielsen is, um, is a usability expert. Now, why that's important is if I said to you, what happens when you click on a logo on a website? We all say we get taken to the home page. And when we say, where would we most likely find the logo? We'd probably say top left. So already without naming and without kind of bringing up specific websites, we've kind of built an idea of what a website should operate, how it should, you know, when we click on the photo of a product, what happens if it's on the product page, it'll zoom out. So we, we've already got these ideas of how a website should work. So we need to make sure that we stick to those rules as an agency. The fundamental difference, however, is down to investment. So you can get a theme from any, and, and I understand, you know, there are some brands that don't have the budget and I completely support that and you have to start somewhere. But don't forget that this is your shop window. It's the same as kind of buying or taking out a lease on a physical store on the high street, a shopping mall and just, you know, not putting any signage on, not doing up the shop and saying, it's all right, you know, I'll just, I'll just paint it all white and I'll just write in pencil the shop name. You need to invest in making your shop attractive. <clears throat> so, Whilst there is a market for templates, the problem is you are telling your customers they need to compromise and adhere to the templates navigation and user journey. And yes, those, those templates have been thought out with an element of, of strategy behind it, but not to the point of saying, you know, you are a company that sells pet food, you are a company that sells clothing, you are a company that sells computers, you're a company that sells, uh, you know, watches. All those customers have got different ways of navigating um, and finding product information. So the, ben the main benefit of having a custom built solution isn't that you can necessarily get all the features you want because nowadays they're pretty agnostic, those things. It's taking what your customer expectations are, what your competitors are doing and what your customers are used to doing on when they're navigating the website for the product that you sell and, a, and kind of creating that journey for them based on the design. So you're, it's not the customer that's been molded to the journey. It's the journey that's been molded to the customer. 
And again, it will just go back to saying they had all the information, they had a countdown timer, they had reviews, they had, you know, customer testimonials, they had, you know, a short description around, you know, the, the dimensions and information and so on. Um, so that's that's one of the most important things is one of you is going to compromise and please don't let it be the customer. Right, especially when we're talking about the importance of personalizing everything to your own customer. Guys, we're at time. Do you have a second to answer Nicole's question? How can you reward loyalty if you don't want to offer incentives? Yeah, I was, I just read that and I was, I was thinking this through and I mean, I think if you're not wanting to offer discounts, points, anything like that, just doing something as simple as giving personalized recommendations um, based off of that customer's previous purchases, that's a great way to reward, reward loyalty because who knows, maybe it's you're recommending something that they didn't know they need or they didn't think of that will, you know, be a really good um, accent to, I believe, Nicole, you sell outdoor furniture. Maybe it's, um, oh no, I'm sorry, that was Christina my mistake. But anyways, in this example, if it were Christina's business, she's selling outdoor furniture and uh, we make a recommendation for outdoor pillows or a rug that'll complement great with the set that was just bought. That's a great way, I think, to, to um, you know, reward for loyalty because it's, you're basically thinking for the customer in that sense. You're, you're getting to know them in essence. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And those tools are out, and I, I fully agree with you. Again, I'm not a fan of kind of, you know, discounting because it's just it's a one-way street. But just, you know, push those unfair advantages. So, again, we spoke about private sales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe not necessarily private sales, but, they you know, some customers get access to the products before they launch. So it's making them feel special, making them feel like they've got a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that you understand them. I think that's, that's really key. But it's going to, you know, whilst it... You, it won't cost you in terms of discounting. It will cost you as an investment in terms of putting the time in to, to put those tools and processes in place to, uh, you know, to be able to help the merchants, uh, to be able to help the customers, sorry. Nicole says amazing, and I agree. Lots of really amazing tips and tricks throughout this entire past hour with you guys. Really appreciate your time coming on here um, to talk to our audience about retention. Um, I think that's it, though. I, th I think we're, we're yeah, wrapping yeah. up. Do we really, have anything else you guys want to add? Well, really quick, want to um, do the giveaways super quickly here. Um, so doing a random selection. And congratulations, Nicole. You are a winner. And Daniel, you are a winner. So um, you will be contacted separately for your winnings. Thank you for being an amazing audience and your participation. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all at the next DTCX webinar here. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.